The central processing unit, also called the CPU, is the centerpiece of every computer hardware architecture. It is the hub of computation, if you will, because this is where all the calculations of the machine uh, take place. And it is also the seat of control. This is where decisions are made about which instruction should be fetched and executed next. In this unit, we're going to talk about uh, the hack CPU, the specification of the, of the CPU, and how we actually are going to build it. Now, as usual, it uh, always pays off to start with the abstraction. So we can think about the hack CPU as some sort of a black box magic that performs two uh, truly remarkable things. First of all, well, it's a 16-bit uh, processor like the entire computer. And the first thing that it can do is, given a certain instruction written in the hack language, it will execute this instruction. Now, this is something which, in my opinion, is truly uh, uh, remarkable and dramatic. Because up until this point, when we wrote programs, the programs existed on a piece of paper. They were completely static. They were simply a bunch of symbols that describe some uh, fantasy of the programmer who wants to actually make something happen. But now we can actually take these programs and put it into a machine that turns them into reality. The programs become music that you can listen to or, or video clips that you can watch or some uh, airline reservation system or whatever. So the CPU is this very unique and special agent that takes this uh, program specification and turns it into a reality. And if this were not enough uh, in its own right, the, the CPU can also do something uh, uh, not less remarkable. In the process of executing the current instruction, it also figures out somehow which instruction should be executed next in the program which is currently running. And of course, since we talk about the heck computer, we assume that all these programs are written in the heck uh, machine language that we studied uh, or looked at in, uh, in week four. So given that this is the uh, uh, CPU abstraction, the next thing that I'd like to discuss is uh, the more detailed specification of this uh, apparatus. Well, the first thing that we have to remember is that the CPU does not work uh, in, in, in isolation. It is connected to other devices inside the computer. In particular, in this uh, uh, particular hack architecture, the CPU is connected both to the instruction memory and to the data memory. With that in mind, here is the specific uh, uh, input and output co connections of the CPU. And let us begin to review them from uh, left to right and from top to bottom. So first of all, we have three inputs coming from three completely different uh, sources. First of all, there is a 16-bit uh, uh, data value, which is the value of the currently selected data memory register. This is the value that the CPU is going to operate on. Now, what exactly do we want the CPU to do? Well, the next input, which we decided to call instruction, which is a very sensible name, describes a 16-bit input, which is the value of the selected instruction memory register. And remember that at any given point of time, there is always a selected uh, register in the instruction memory, and there is always a selected uh, 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 memory uh, register in the data memory. So always something comes into the CPU. The third input, which we uh, decided to call reset, is a one-bit input, which I will discuss later in this unit. On the right-hand side, we see the outputs of the ALU. So first of all, if the ALU wants to write something to the data memory, it has to specify three different things. Number one, what is it that we want to write? And, and this is stored in a, uh, or emitted through uh, 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 an output called AltM. Number two, where do we want to write it? We have to provide an address, and this is the, uh, 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 the job of the next uh, uh, data output. And the third output is a load bit that enables the data memory for write operations. So these are the three uh, data outputs, if you will, of the CPU. In addition, there is one extremely important output, which we decided to call uh, PC, for reasons that will become clear uh, in a few minutes. And this output holds 
by some sort of magic, the address of the next instruction that has to be fetched and executed in the next cycle of this computer. <clears throat> so, how do we implement this magic? How do we make uh, uh, all these uh, good things uh, actually happen? Well, here is one way of doing it. This is our proposed implementation of the functionality that we just described. It is not the only way to build the CPU, but this is a pretty good one because it's very elegant and simple and relatively easy to do. So before we get into uh, the actual details of this architecture, let us look at the interface. If we look at the interface of this uh, uh, hardware diagram, we see that it is 100% identical to what we saw before. We have three inputs coming in and we have four outputs coming out. And given that we made this observation, we can now delve into the details of the actual architecture. Another important thing that we have to look at uh, before we begin to understand what is going on here is that within this architecture, we have many labels uh, uh, labeled by uh, the uh, catch-all symbol C, which I use to represent the notion of control bits. So in order to make all these chips work together, the designer of the CPU has to make sure that different bits, different control bits arrive to the right locations and these multiple messages together will cause the CPU to do what it's, uh, what it's supposed to, to be doing. Now, if you look at this architecture, you know, after the first uh, minute or two of uh, bewilderment, you will realize that everything here is extremely standard. Uh, you see the ALU, which you built in, uh, in project two, uh, we see three registers, which uh, we call A, D, and, <coughs> and PC, and these registers are identical to chips that you built in, uh, in Project 3. And we see two MOOCs, which we built in, uh, in uh, week one of the course, in Project 1. And therefore, putting together this architecture is just a matter of assembling uh, chip parts that you've already built in previous uh, uh, weeks in this course. Another thing that you see in this diagram is all these C labels, which indicate control bits that go into various locations in various chips. Now, we have intentionally uh, left those, uh, the specification of these uh, control bits uh, somewhat uh, opaque because we want you to figure out how to actually piece all these things together. And we'll have much more to say about it in the unit that discusses uh, how we actually uh, build this architecture. Now, before we build it, we have to describe what this architecture actually does. And in doing so, I find it kind of uh, uh, interesting to think about this architecture as, as an orchestra, an orchestra that uh, uh, works together many different instruments in order to produce some great symphony, and the symphony is the execution of the current program. You know, just like a regular orchestra, it can, it can uh, play many different uh, 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 pieces of music and the current program determines what it actually uh, executes. So I would like in the remainder of this unit to focus on different sections uh, in this uh, architecture and let us begin with this section that deals with the current instruction. So zooming in on this section, we see that it consists uh, uh, mainly of uh, a register called A and an instruction input that connects to this register through a multiplexer. And here is uh, an A instruction arriving to the uh, uh, machine in the current cycle or some cycle. And here is also the symbolic mnemonic of the same instruction, which is easier to read, but uh, obviously the computer doesn't care about it at all. This is just for communications between me and you. So we see that this instruction seeks to load uh, uh, the value 3001 into the A register. And of course, to do everything in binary. So in order to carry out this instruction, the CPU has to do several things. First of all, it has to decode the instruction. It has to take the 16-bit value and separate it into an opcode and a 15-bit address or a 15-bit value. By the way, how do we know that it's an A instruction? Well, we can look at the opcode. The opcode is zero, and according to the hack machine language specification, it means that it's an A instruction. So the CPU says, aha, I know what to do with it. I have to take the next 15-bit uh, uh, value and put it inside the A register. And notice that this is exactly what uh, the gate diagram does. The 16-bit uh, uh, values go through the register. 
and, and into the register. Another thing that the, uh, that the CPU does, and we cannot see it in this uh, diagram in order to avoid clutter, but this is something very simple. It takes uh, the output of the A register and emits it outside the, <coughs> the CPU uh, via the uh, output, which we called, I think, uh, address M or M address. You can look it up in the overall architecture of the computer. So this is how the CPU handles an A instruction. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at is how the CPU handles a C instruction. Because after all, in this uh, hack machine language, we have two generic instruction types, an A instruction and a C instruction. So we have to be able to entertain and handle any one of these instructions. Well, the C instruction, like the A instruction, consists of different fields. And the first field is the opcode, which happens to be one. This is how the CPU can tell that this is a C instruction. But in addition to this, we have several other fields, and we can see, th we can see them more, more clearly if we look at the symbolic uh, uh, manifestation of the same instruction. Now, notice that I'm using uh, color coding to associate the bits with the symbolic uh, mnemonics, but these colors obviously are completely meaningless for the computer. They are just a way for us to, to communicate more easily in the course. So, how does the CPU handle with such an instruction? Well, you may have guessed, the first thing that has to be done is to decode the instruction. So the ALU takes this 16-bit uh, value and it decodes it into four different fields. And these fields will later on be used uh, in order to uh, power up and manipulate different elements inside the computer architecture. What we discussed so far was how uh, the CPU handles the A instruction. But if you look at the gate diagram, you see that the same A register can be also fed, not necessarily from the instruction input, but rather from the ALU output. So we have to decide. In some cases, we want the A register to be fed from the instruction, and in other cases, we want uh, the ALU to be fed from the ALU output. Now, you may have guessed how we do it. We know that in different situations we deal with two different instructions. In some cases it's an A instruction with an opcode of zero, and in this case we want the input to come from the instruction. In other cases it's a C instruction with an opcode of one, and in this case we want to, uh, 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 to root the input of the A register in such a way that the input will come from the ALU. So it is the job of the CPU uh, designer to inspect the opcode of the incoming instruction and decide from which uh, source the A register will take its, uh, its next uh, uh, contents, so to speak. All right, so this is uh, roughly how the uh, uh, CPU handles incoming instructions. And uh, let's go back to the overall architecture and focus on the next section that I'd like to discuss, which is uh, uh, the operation of the ALU, which is by far the most uh, uh, complex uh, uh, part of this architecture. All right, now uh, we see here this uh, segment that deals with the ALU, and we see a C instruction coming in uh, instead of the A instruction that we saw before. And let us remember that the C instruction consists of different fields of bits, each one of which means something else. And uh, another thing that we have to remember is that the ALU is a combinational chip. It always computes something. There's always some inputs coming in, and there's always some output coming out. And when you look at the uh, uh, diagram, you see that the inputs of the ALU come from two different sources. One of them is the D register, the current value of the D register, and the other one is either the value of the A register or the value of the selected memory, memory register, and there's a multiplexer that takes care of this decision of where to take the value from. And the control bit of this multiplexer is one of the bits in the instruction. So once again, the CPU designer has to take care to take this bit that determines from which we want to read the input of the ALU, and uh, the ALU will then get the correct inputs or the inputs that the programmer intended it uh, to receive. So we have the inputs lodged in the input spins of the ALU, and uh, the ALU goes to work, and uh, how does it know what to do? Well, the ALU also has 
uh, uh, six control bits that basically taken together tell or specify the ALU which operation we want to carry out. Now these bits are taken from the instruction and I'm using some color coding here to, uh, uh, to help distinguish which bits go where but of course these colors are completely meaningless as far as the computer is concerned and I'm using them only for uh, didactic uh, purposes. So the CPU designer has to take these uh, six uh, green bits or uh, more accurately copies of these bits and uh, uh, route them all the way to the uh, uh, control bits of the ALU. So now that we have all this information, we have uh, the input data, we have the uh, operation that we have to carry out, we can uh, actually, the ALU can actually compute something and out comes the ALU output. Now, uh, inspecting the diagram, we see that the ALU output is simultaneously fed into three different destinations. The first destination is the D register. The second destination is the A register and it goes through a multiplexer. And the final destination is outside the interface of the chip, so to speak. So the same ALU is fanned out into three different places and so we have the situation that we have uh, uh, the same ALU output knocking on three different doors. But the, first, the, the fact that it knocks on these doors does not necessarily mean that the doors are going to open. We have to decide, or the programmer has to decide, which door has to be opened. This decision is made by the next uh, 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 field of bits that I want to uh, focus on, and these are called in our uh, jargon, we call them destination bits. We have three destination bits, and these bits determine whether or not to open the D register, the A register, and the data memory to accept the ALU output. So if, uh, for example, the green bits would have been 0, 0, 0, then it's very nice that the ALU computes something, but this value will be lost. No container in this computer will, uh, uh, will be open for business, so to speak. And if we set these green bits to 1, 1, 1, then all of these containers will receive the same uh, output simultaneously. So we can play with these bits as, as we've done uh, 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 in week four when we uh, wrote programs, uh, although we did it in assembly and in symbolic way, we can do it with machine language. And uh, once again, uh, we have a way to program this architecture uh, so that the ALU output, output will be uh, selectively absorbed by different locations in this uh, architecture. All right, moving along. Another thing that we have to remember is that the ALU also computes and outputs two control outputs, which I think we call the ZR and, and NG. And these two control bits uh, document whether or not the ALU output is negative or zero. And these two outputs play a key role in what will be described next, which is the control logic of the uh, CPU. But before we talk about this logic, I want to, uh, 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 as promised, I want to say a few words about the reset input that we see uh, coming, coming into the uh, diagram from the left uh, hand side at the bottom of the slide. And of course, when you build a chip, all these sides up, down, left, right mean uh, absolutely nothing, but it's, it's useful uh, to communicate about it when we talk about uh, gate diagrams. So let us say a few words about uh, this uh, reset bit and in order to do it we have to try to envision how the heck computer will look like if we actually set out to build it. Well it will be a black box and as you see this black box is equipped with a single push down button and this push down button is called reset in our, uh, in our uh, jargon. And the idea is the following. This black box, the hex, com the hex computer, is already loaded with some program written in the hex machine language. And up until now, it does nothing. The program is inside, but nothing is happening. Well, if you take your finger and push this reset button in and let, let go, what will happen is that the computer will start running the current program. Well, you look at whatever comes out of this computer and in a few minutes you will see that uh, we can uh, attach a screen to it and a keyboard. You look at the program's execution and at some point you decide to reset uh, the computer or rerun the same program again. You take your finger, you push it inside uh, um, the reset button, you let go 
And by doing this, the computer will restart running the same program again. Okay, so this is the kind of behavior that we want to implement uh, in, the, uh, in the control logic of the uh, CPU, among other things. All right, so now that we understand uh, how the uh, reset uh, button works from the outside of the computer, so to speak, uh, let's go back to the uh, CPU logic and explore uh, the control logic of the CPU. Well, um, it doesn't make sense to talk about control if we don't have some instruction that, uh, that gives uh, meaning to, uh, to the control operation. So here is an example of a C instruction, and um, uh, it's a schematic instruction. It's not zeros and ones, but I used uh, some mnemonics to, uh, uh, and also color coding, which is completely meaningless as far as the computer goes. I used these mnemonics and colors in order to uh, uh, emphasize that we have here, here different fields of bits. Each field is designed to do something else. Uh, in the overall computer architecture. And when we talk about control, I want you to focus on these three bits, which we call the jump bits. Uh, if you recall, if uh, the three jump bits are zero, it represents a no jump situation. If the three jump bits are one, it represents unconditional go to. And any other combinations of zeros and ones in the jump bits uh, represents a conditional go to. What I've just said is part of the hack machine language specification. And now it's the job of the CPU to turn this specification into reality, to realize uh, uh, this abstraction. So how do we do it? Well, the hero of our story is a humble register called program counter. It's actually a counter. And uh, uh, the program counter is also called uh, PC in our jargon. And uh, in what follows, we want to focus on what happens inside the PC. So here is the desired uh, uh, operation of a typical program counter. First of all, and, and for most, uh, the one thing that we want the program counter to do is to always emit the address of the next instruction that has to be executed. So let's keep this in mind. Now, if you want to start or restart uh, the computer, well, in this case, we have to set PC to zero because we want to execute the first instruction in the program. So PC equals zero makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, if we have a no jump situation, if uh, the current instruction is such that uh, uh, the three J bits are zero, then we want the program counter to increment uh, by uh, one step so that the next instruction that we will execute will be instruction number one, and then instruction number two, and three, and four, and so on, as long as we don't have a jump. However, if the current instruction is such that uh, all the J bits are one, then we have a conditional, I'm sorry, we have an unconditional go-to. And in the case of an unconditional go-to, we want to set the PC to A. Why? Because if the programmer, if the programmer knows what he's doing, then the programmer has already taken care to enter the address that you want to jump to, to the A register. So if we do PC equals A, PC, the program counter, will emit uh, uh, the address of the next instruction that has to be executed. And finally, if only some of the J bits are, are, are one, one or two of the J bits uh, are one, then we have a conditional go to. If we have a conditional go-to, we have to look at the ALU output and decide if this go-to should, should actually materialize. That's the whole idea of conditional. We have to check if the condition is true or false. If the condition is true, then we want to make a jump. Otherwise, we want to ignore the go-to and just do PC++. So I hope that you are convinced that this uh, uh, abstraction makes sense. That's exactly how a program counter has to work in every computer. And uh, what remains to be seen is how do we actually make it happen? Well, the answer is already uh, on the screen here in front of you. Uh, the uh, logic architecture is such that the PC will do exactly what we want it to do. And let us convince ourselves that this is indeed the case. Well, let's look at the uh, uh, reset input. And remember that in order to start the computer, uh, in, in order to cause the computer to start uh, executing the current, the current program, we push the reset button in and we let go. So if PC, I'm sorry, if the register is one, we want to set 
PC to zero. Otherwise, we have to look at the current instruction. And the current instruction may or may not have uh, uh, jump bits. If the jump bits are, uh, 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 well, given any combination of jump bits, you know, all the way from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, and all the possible eight combinations of three, uh, uh, of three uh, jump bits, given every one of these combinations, we have to look at the jump bits and simultaneously look at the ALU output and decide if we really want to carry out a jump. So in the slide, I describe this uh, decision as a function, this F function, which I made up, completely meaningless in the computer uh, uh, architecture. But uh, I'm using this uh, symbol F to, uh, 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 to, to try to say that we look at these two different pieces of data together. We combine somehow uh, this information and we make a decision. Do we want to jump or not? I store the result of this decision in the symbol load. And if you look at the diagram, you see that this load is actually the load bit of the program counter. So if load ends up being 1, yes, we want to jump. So we do PC equals A. PC equals uh, the current uh, uh, value of the A register, which contains the address to which we want to jump. Otherwise, we do PC++. At the end of all this operation, and when all the dust clears, what we'll get is that the PC always emits the address of the next instruction that has to be fetched and executed. This uh, pretty much wraps up the, uh, uh, the description of the uh, CPU implementation, and the only thing that remains to do is to actually build it. But before we set out to build it, we have to remember that all this complexity is just one element in the overall computer architecture. That said, it is by far the most complex and interesting element in the architecture, and we are going to build it, not now, but uh, after the next unit, because in the next unit we'll describe the overall uh, uh, architecture of the hack computer, and then we'll get our hands dirty and actually set out to build both the CPU and the entire hack computer.